everyone. Um, you will, I think, just have heard that um, this meeting is being recorded. Um, and one other uh, piece of information, namely that Human Rights Education Review is so successful that it's moving from two issues a year to three issues a year. And so they need to reinforce their editorial team. People like you, we suspect, are the kind of people who might want to consider uh, becoming uh, members of the editorial team, learning uh, how to, uh, to, to edit human rights education uh, articles and indeed feed in your ideas for how, how the journal can, can progress. So you will find details of that on the Human Rights Education Review website, and I think Audrey will say something a, a bit later. So I was simply introducing, I'm now going to hand over to Audrey, who will chair this webinar uh, and invite Audrey to introduce Cornelia and Anne. Hello, everyone. It, I am Audrey Osler, and I'm really, really delighted to welcome to our webinar series this evening, uh, Dr. Anne Becker and Professor Cornelia Roux from, the, uh, from Stellenbosch University. It is um, uh, an important uh, occasion for me because we have begun in the field of human rights education, perhaps a little bit slowly, but um, perhaps we're going cautiously um, to talk about decolonizing the curriculum and, and what that might mean uh, for us as human rights educators. And um, it's been my experience that when new areas of thought develop into an established area, there are sometimes uh, conflicts or, or strains between different branches of, of those areas. I, I would like to um, commend Anne who published uh, a paper on uh, decolonial human rights education, changing the terms and content of conversations on human rights uh, for the way that she has approached this, the very sensitive way she's approached this, this topic, um, because it's very, very easy, I think, for some of us to think, oh, well, my way of doing things is superior to your way of doing things, and we'll throw all the, all the old out. And, and just bring in the new. And I think what um, both speakers this evening hope to do is to challenge us to think about what decolonizing the human rights education curriculum do, uh, implies, but in a way that's not saying everything must go or we are thinking in a superior way uh, to people who've uh, worked in this area uh, a decade ago or who are working in it now and we know best. I think it's a very sensitive and, and thoughtful uh, contribution on decolonizing the human rights education curriculum and therefore I really commend the, the written paper to you. Um, both Anne and Cornelia uh, tell me that they are able to devote all their professional activities towards um, writing and research, um, Anne as uh, a research fellow and Cornelia as a professor emer emerita. So uh, they're, they're in a very special position, I think, at this stage in their careers and, and have a lot, lot to offer and a lot to thought. So I really um, welcome both of them. Uh, I ask you again, as Hugh has done, to save your questions and comments for the the end in the chat box. And if you have other kinds of reflections uh, to make um, about what is going on, to share those more broadly using social media, either during the presentation or after, but to reserve the chats, uh, chat line. Otherwise, I won't be able to select questions. And when you ask a question in the chat line, please can you put your name um, and uh, possibly uh, your institution or the area of the world uh, that you're speaking from, so that, that I have a sense of trying to include as, as many different uh, voices as possible. So I'm gonna hand over now to, to our speakers. A very warm welcome to you both. It's very appropriate, I think, that um, human rights education, decolonizing the curriculum is coming from South Africa because we have seen very important uh, moves in this direction there. And perhaps what might seem to some of us 
um, controversial moves with support for decolonizing the curriculum coming from governments, which is not the case, I think, for mo most of us. So I hand over to them and, and look forward to what they have to say. Welcome, both of you. Thank you, Audrey. Uh, thank you for the introduction and this opportunity. I just, we just want to say good morning, good evening, good, good afternoon, whichever it might be, to uh, all our colleagues and friends. Uh, welcome and thank you very much for joining us. Now, the, the aim of the publication in Human Rights Education Review was to expose some colonial assumptions in human rights and human rights education but also to search for possibilities for decolonial resistance to coloniality in human rights education. So when we think decolonial or speak about decoloniality, um, place of enunciation or context is extremely important. I will therefore um, introduce Cornelia Rue and ask her to talk about um, our context, South Africa, uh, our research group, and the project from which the data for this uh, paper stem. Cornelia. Thank you, Anne. Um, I'm a white woman from Africa, resides in a multi layered South African family, educated in the privileged white education system lectured in edu teacher education at universities pre and post 94. And my research in human rights education is to unravel the complexities of dignity, indignity, equality, and inequality. Violations of people's rights of being is inherent part of our South African histories and cultures of remembrance. First in colonization, slavery, battles for freedom, apartheid, and thereafter the democratic dispensation based on equality and inclusion of all the people that live in South Africa. Between 94 and 2003, actions were taken to address the ills of the past with the Bill of Rights today, 25 years ago, as well as legislations, policies, and education programs. The Human Rights Education and Diversity Research Group since 1994 was initiated to explore the complexities of human rights in education due to the lack of research findings, initiatives, and guide teacher education programs to transformative curriculum developments. The national research funded project from previous, derived from previous research and personal experience indicated a lack of understanding knowledge, skills, and human rights values in teacher training in schools. We became aware that the sustainability of human rights education, especially in developing democracies and post-colonial conflict societies, might increasingly be at risk. This project did not aim to explore or understand decoloniality. The main aim was, in short, to explore material realities in place, space, time, and to explore fundamentals to determine what human rights literacies entail and how they can establish, develop, and improve transformative curriculum and teaching learning approaches in the South African context. The rhizomatic research paradigm with grounded methodologies fitted the complexity of the research aim and rationale. The paradigm creates a research space to valorize difference, diversity, pluralism, uniqueness, and subjectivity, and supported our search for meaning for human rights in diverse place, space, time contexts. Phase 1, 2012 to 14, involved five South African universities, and phase 2, 2015 to 16, involved seven international universities at five countries. The linear survey was linked to epistemological communities in place, space, time, and each researcher within their context communicated, understand, and explained the data and context, but did not dominate the discourse. This next slide indicates the first phase of the project 2012 to 14 in South Africa. We started with walkabouts for university campuses with the question, what is human rights? The pilot study thereafter questionnaire was developed and executed on one campus with be it postgraduate program students, which of them were already qualified teachers. 
2013, survey questionnaires on the internet computer labs on six campuses, including the born free generation, those students born after the democratic dispensation, so that we can have an inclusive group of students. We've got in 2014 voluntary focus groups on all campuses and a few months later follow up focus groups on selective campuses. Reason, gaps found in the survey and the focus groups and to crystallize notion of human rights literacies. The crystallization of the data in every gathering process was important to temporarily suspend at first the process of examining or reading the data and seeking to reflect on the analysis experiences and an attempt to identify and articulate patterns or themes noticed during the immersion process. In the quest to make meaning of the existing gap between human rights and human rights education and the lived everyday realities of people in our diverse context, we argue that human rights literacy should be explored through both approaches. Phase two started in 2015 after reporting and publications of the phases one, and our international college showed very much interest in wanted to take part in the project. And we were very glad and interested to, in, to strengthen our data and methodologies. The survey on the internet was altered by the South African team in collaboration with our international colleagues in order to include the then international issues on human rights. The linear survey was conducted and researchers in each country defined their communities in the respective universities and if needed, could include focus group discussion to crystallize the data. 2015 survey online was with seven international universities in Germany, the Netherlands, Israel, India, and South Africa. Israel had a focus group in 2015 and in 2016, the Netherlands. At the end of the data collection, the data, the South African team administered a follow-up email question to all students in phase two with the question, what is human rights? linking the question to the first question asked in the pilot study. Theory and analysis were again executed in every phase and data collection, working and linking towards theory into praxis. Again, crystallization of the data resulted in reporting of the respective researchers. The final outcome was a book publication on human rights literacies, future directions involving all the respective researchers and ending with a critical analysis of the discourses. This collaboration started a new project with our Dutch colleagues in 2020 on conversations about human rights, human rights education, and human rights literacies between the two countries, focusing on human rights education and the role of its histories and cultures of remembrance. I thank you for your time. Um, when I speak about um, decoloniality, it is as a white, white women in Africa, specifically South Africa. My educational background is Euro Western, but I'm situated in a country still battling with the consequences of colonization, apartheid, and coloniality. During the previous webinar on the role of law and legal knowledge for transformative human rights education, we spoke about education and resistance. Today, I want to speak about decolonial human rights education as resistance in education. I will also propose that de decoloniality should be one of the literacy of human rights education. Starting in 2015, South Africa had various student protests relating to decolonizing specifically in higher education. That concerned higher education systems, structures, and curricula. Now, if you look at this banner here, it says decolonize, reclaim, reimagine. So we can then ask, what would that mean for human rights education? I will attempt to answer that by asking four questions. First, what is decoloniality? Second, 
why decoloniality? Then thirdly, very important, what do we decolonize? And then in the last place, I will give some suggestions regarding decolonizing human rights education. Now, when we ask the question, what is decoloniality? It is very important to remember that there is a difference between coloniality and colonization and decoloniality and decolonization. Colonization is the physical colonizing of countries, regions, territories, and peoples by an imperial power. That happened to South Africa in 1652. Now, decolonization is the liberation of those countries from imperial rule. Coloniality and decoloniality are implied in each other and they are interrelated. Coloniality is embedded patterns and of, of power of knowledge and of being still visible in global society. Coloniality furthermore cannot be separate, separated from Euro modernity and from hegemony. So decoloniality then is the continual resistance against coloniality. Decoloniality is not a theory and it's not a paradigm. It is an option to resist coloniality. It is a way of thinking and a way of living. It is also a praxis and a process. Very important, decoloniality is ongoing conversations. It's a conversation on relational pluriversal knowledges and ways of being. These conversations are always bottom up, communal, and they are embedded in the struggles of a pluriversal humanity. So if we go back to the previous slide and we then ask what might the students mean by reclaim and reimagine, what they might mean is they want to reclaim the voices and the knowledges silenced through colonization and coloniality. What would they like to reimagine? They would like to reimagine a higher education uh, system, which is pluriversal, inclusive, and um, for everyone. Now, if we ask why decoloniality? Decoloniality is not new. The notion of decolonial human rights is also not new. It goes back to the 1950s. It is also important to remember that decolonization, not decoloniality, but decolonization was very much part of the conversation during the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is, however, also true that the atrocities of colonization were never questioned or interrogated during the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, neither were the concept human questions. So also very uh, problematic for decolonial scholars is the fact that human rights are mostly read through a Euro-Western lens. That is even when there are multiple other contextual frames in the world through which human rights could be and should be understood. Now, what do we decolonize? Minolo argues that the main task of decoloniality is to decolonize the human and to liberate a pluriversal humanity. 
Now, there are many different colonial experiences around the world, and they would therefore also be many different decolonial options and answers to colonial um, experiences in the world. In the publication, I only spoke about terms and content of conversations in human rights education, about the human in human rights education, and the need for pluriversal knowledges and pluriversal human rights education. Now, pluriversality regards the coexistence of multiple different um, knowledges and ways of being in human rights education. Today, I will only speak about the terms and content of conversations and the human in human rights. Now, in any conversation, the terms and content are very important. In colonial framework, terms and content are interrelated and there's a continuous movement between terms and content. So if we look at the terms, also referred to as the enunciation, it regards the assumption in human rights education. It also regards the rules and the principles of knowledge production and dissemination in human rights education. If we want to analyze the terms of conversations in human rights education, we need to ask um, three questions. Who speaks? From where do they speak? And for who do they speak? So if we look at this data excerpt in blue, it says, life in the Netherlands is all inclusive regarding human rights. However, not self-evident in the third world. So if we ask who speaks, it is students from the Netherlands. From where do they speak? They speak through a Euro Western lens. For who do they speak? They speak about peoples of the third world. Conversations in the colonial framework is never inclusive. It is not with the other. It is always about the other and or for the other. Now, those that speak also determine the content of human rights education. So it will be a, a consequence thereof will be if human rights are only read through a Euro Western lens, then knowledge in human, human rights education will be Euro Western. So the content regards what knowledge we validate, how we teach, how we know in human rights education. So just if we look at the data excerpt in blue again, I would say that human rights is very much um, part of Africa. It's what it says. It relates to Ubuntu. So we can hear, we can also ask who speaks, it is South African students. From where do they speak? They speak from South Africa, from the African continent. For who do they speak? They speak for themselves. So if we now go to the um, human in human rights, this um, topic has always been very interesting to me, but also very important in decolonial work. As I've said before, the concept human was never questioned during the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The co uh, concept human with the capital H is a colonial Euro Western construction. And that is because during colonization, Vertical identities were created to explain human difference. 
race specifically because of its intersectional nature is highly problematic in this regard. It concerns the degree of humanity attributed to different identities and subjectivities. You can only think what dire consequences that have for, um, for identity and for belonging. As whiteness is inscribed in the Euro-Western human, the lighter the skin, the closer to full humanity and vice versa. So if we think back to 2020 and the global Black Lives Matter um, movement and protest, the Black Lives Matter movement is in essence a decolonial resistance. When protesters claim that Black Lives Matter, that they have worth and value, they do what Fanon propagated in the 1950s. When the other was reluctant to recognize me, and by that he means to recognize me as fully human, I had no other choice but to make myself known. So what these protesters did in essence was to make themselves known as fully human and as included in humanity. We can now ask, how do we decolonize? And I just want to say that decolonizing work is, is difficult and it's contentious. And like Audrey said, there's dissonance uh, involved but it is always also healing work. It heals a global society. So the first question we <clears throat> ask ourselves is what is my position? What can I decolonize? Now, there are many possible places where you can decolonize in a classroom, in a lecture room, in a um, research group, uh, even in a webinar like this one. So <clears throat> there are also many different paths to decolonizing. Minolo, for example, argues that decolonizing should start with epistemology, the, de the decolonizing of the coloniality of knowledge. While Fanon, on the other hand, argues that it should start with ontology, the decolonizing of the coloniality of being. I propose a interrelated, ongoing, relational, ontoepistemological process for decolonizing or becoming human uh, based on Fennin's three phases of decolonizing. Now, the three phases are interrelated and then there's continuous movement. They are only separated for analytical purposes. First step, to decolonize myself. By that, I mean, you have each of us has to acknowledge our colonial assumptions and maybe also analyze and reflect on your colonial oppression. The next um, phase is recognition. Recognition of each other's mutual humanity, which goes beyond legal recognition. It requires the recognition of each human included as fully human into humanity. Now recognition demands a plurality of voices speaking for themselves. That 
then we can go back to the student pro protests, to the Black Lives Matter protests, even the Me Too protests, because um, gender and sexism is very much part of the colonial framework and colonial categorization. What they did is they speak, spoke for themselves in claiming recognition, full recognition as part of the human family. And that is also where the global we comes in. We, the global we, decolonize. The third step then is knowledges and ways of being. It is to create a space in human rights education where pluriversal, that means different, equally different knowledges and ways of being coexist in human rights education. Thank you and we really uh, look forward to your questions and the conversation. Thank you, both of you. Uh, we're still waiting, I think, for questions uh, to come. Um, and I have um, perhaps a half-formulated question um, myself, um, and I expressed it in this half-formulated uh, way. It seems to me that a lot of the energies of um, decolonizing the curriculum have focused on knowledges and that the, um, uh, the, the work of decolonizing the self, this ontological work hasn't necessarily been seen um, as part of it in, in many frames of thinking so that people will go as far, for example, as saying where they come from, you know, I, I'm speaking as, as a white woman from X, or I'm speaking as a mixed race woman from Y, uh, but it doesn't seem to me to go that much further in, in general research. And I wonder if you have any reflections on the implications of, of that. Yes, yes. Um, I think specifically in South Africa, um, and maybe other parts of the world as well. Um, our participants can enlighten us. There's been such a focus on decolonizing and decolonization uh, and such a frenzy. So what happens is we, we use the, the Euro-Western curriculum and we add Ubuntu and we add um, indigenous knowledges and we add extra knowledges to make it seem like we are decolonizing. While in essence for me, and I mean the, there's many decolonial scholars like Nolo which might differ from me, it, the root of the prob problem is ontological. And that is why we keep on having these Black Lives Matter protests and Me Too protests, because we never, never question what we mean by the human in human rights. Thank you. Um, we have a question uh, from Ina. Ina to Avest, I um, hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Would you like to put forward your own question? Yeah, well, my question really is, are we aiming at a kind of peaceful living together? Uh, are we aiming at solving all the conflicts? Or is there maybe a constructive place for conflicts in this living together in our global society? Um, I don't think, and I, I think there's consensus on the fact that we will never get rid of coloniality. Coloniality is such a broad um, framework and that decolonial 
um, resistance should be continuous. But um, yes, there will always be conflict. And I think decoloniality is about dissonance and maybe disruption because when we confront our own assumptions, when we speak decolonial, when we think decolonial, there will always be a dissonance or a disruption. So the point is not to get a situation where we live happily ever after, because I don't think um, I don't think that 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 will ever happen. Well. We hope, but I don't think so. But that is not not the point of the coloniality. But don't don't you think, Anne? If I may, please, don't you think that maybe we need the conflicts uh, to um, in our in our way of living together and in our way of uh, gaining respect for each other's uniqueness? Yes, yes. I think we need uh, not uh, uh, obviously not physical conflict, not violence. We need a continuous conflict in terms of confronting our own assumptions and the assumptions of others and recognizing yeah, every I, human as fully human. Yes. Yeah, I agree. That's why we need each other. Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> okay, true. thank you, Anne. Uh, we have a question also from uh, Joe Meyer from South Africa. Joy Meyer. Is Joy there? Um, I think Joy is speaking and is muted. You need to unmute. Apologies. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm doing my um, literature review on such occasion, and I find it very interesting that Ubuntu is seen as a shared value for South Africans that um, can promote social cohesion. But I'm wondering, um, what is your opinion um, on Ubuntu in our current society um, as it stands right now? In terms of Ubuntu and decoloniality, is that what you mean? Um, yes. Of, yes, yeah, yes. Okay, yeah. we we had a conversation the other day, very interesting conversation the other day on um um Fanon and his theories of decolonization. I just wanted to go back a bit and, and say that de decolonization can never be essentialism. So decolonization does not mean Africanization. And I think in, in South Africa specifically, there's some, um, there's some uh, different past where some scholars uh, argue for Africanization like we get rid of all Western values, which is not the goal of decoloniality. Um, and then others want a more pluriversal um, uh, uh, society in terms of knowledges and ways of being. But I think it's, it's very difficult. Decolonial work is very difficult. And if we go back to Fanon, uh, we, we, you asked about social co cohesion. Fanon actually said, and he warned against um, substituting being for having. And I think in South Africa, that is a problem. Instead of decolonizing being or the ontological decolonizing, we substitute that for having. And that is why we have so much corruption and um, uh, problems in that regard. While most of our people, and I mean, you also from, from South Africa, most of our people are still disposable bodies. So even in a post 94 South Africa, 
we've had we had millions of people, and I think COVID illustrates that, who are just disposable bodies. So yes, there's a lot of work to be done. Okay, I'd like to invite um, uh, Christy Aridilius Palmer from Minnesota, USA, to uh, ask her question next. Christy. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Thanks, Audrey. And I'm actually in France right now. But oh, okay. <laughs> my question, uh, um, I, I guess I'm wondering what you think, uh, how, how do you relate the coloniality of human rights education within the dynamic of individual and collective rights and responsibility? Or do you not? Yes, yes, yes. Um, individual and collective rights. Uh, that's an interesting uh, question. Um, it depends on, on the focus you put on individual rights, because if you read human rights through a Euro Western lens, then individual rights will be extremely important to you. But if you like, for example, read human rights through an African or South African um, lens, uh, by means of Ubuntu, the African culture and Ubuntu as a shared value in South Africa is very much communal. So it is about the rights, my rights within my community. The individual is not taken out of the community. And that is, that is a big difference in understanding, for example, dignity. Because um, dignity, for example, in a Euro Western um, uh, frame, is about individualism, and rationalism, and and, and um, rational thought, and all of that. In in dignity, in an African or South African context, is about my community. It's about relations. It is about how I am in my community or in relation to others in my community. So I don't know if that answered answer your question. I think it, it gets to it. And, and then I think um, if you're focused on human, you know, how is that also connecting potentially to land, justice, water? Absolutely, yes. And the non-human yes. entities. Yes. That is a very interesting thing that you raised because in, in that sense, um, decoloniality is, is a lot like post-humanism because post-humanism is now decentering the human towards the, um, the earth, the cosmos um, and, and, and every uh, all matter around us. Decolonial, and if you if you think about indigenous knowledge, that has always been part of the knowledge system: the cosmos, the earth, water, fire. So that is not new to them. It's only new to us when we move towards post-humanism. So in that sense, it is it is time for us to think about the human in human rights in a much broader sense than the individual um, white male property owner <laughs> after the French Revolution. And from there, all the, from then, all the others were added. So yes, it's very interesting. Thing. I'm, going, I'm going to ask, I'm, I'm aware of questions coming along now. I'm going to ask Corley and then after Corley, Janet. I'm sorry if I've <laughs> missed you with your hands up. Uh, Corley, please. Um, thank you very much. Um, Corley Giliumia from University of Pretoria Social Work. <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Anne and Cornelia, for this discussion. I just want to say that I'm so glad you mentioned the healing value of decoloniality now, because I think we're at a point where everybody realizes decolonialization has happened. And 
what I see is more of a, it's like a gravy of Ubuntu, a little sauce, um, indigenization that's just being thrown over the curriculum. And by that we mean we are decolonizing. And there's a lot of antagonism I see it amongst the social work colleagues where I, um, academia where I work, <clears throat> a lot of antagonization attacking each other about you don't understand what decoloniality means because you're white. Um, it's, a, it's, it, it's a discussion that can only be taken forward by black people or black academics. So for, for me, it is, um, I think the yielding value that you mentioned is not <laughs> being addressed um, enough. Uh, we are not open to each other's stories or interpretations. Uh, what would healing mean? And I would also like to ask, if you're working with asking students all over the world these questions, how would you bring these students together? Do they have an opportunity to talk with one another? What's happening in South Africa or in the Netherlands? Um, how can that also become a new conversation that might have more healing value that we can cross-pollinate across countries to understand this so yes i think for me there is a, a huge huge um need for coming to a new point of of um, get uh, to understand one another to talk about how can we heal what are the stories how can we um bring that in that's all i wanted to say thank you thank you you make a very very valid point because um decolonizing can never exclude whites because whites need to decolonize themselves. They need to be part of the process of decolonizing. Decolonizing needs a global we. That is what decolonizing needs. And that is what we should work towards. Obviously, I can never understand the colonial experiences of um, my black colleagues or black friends, but I don't claim to understand it. I cannot understand it, but I'm speaking for myself in my own decolonizing journey towards becoming decolonial. So that is extremely important, number one. And I think the healing function, especially in a country like South Africa, and I mean, there are uh, um, many, not similar, but contexts like in South America and, and all over the world, where people has been so um, brutalized through colonization and, and, and still through coloniality that, I think we should really um, have broader conversations as well in terms of how can we um, build relations across contexts in terms of decolonizing. Thank you for that. Thank you. Let, let's go to Janet next. She's been patiently waiting. Janet? Hi, um, my name is Janet from the University of Pretoria. I'm an LLD candidate at the Center for Human Rights. Um, for France de Lyon is my supervisor and he asked me to join this session because my research is um, on decolonizing human rights and curriculum in Africa. So I would first start off with um, what Curly said when um, she talked about African black people actually championing the cause for decolonizing the curriculum in Africa. And when I was looking for a supervisor for this topic that I love so much, it was difficult getting a black supervisor, someone who was black, who was interested in what I was doing. In fact, my two supervisors are white people who are one is interested in the science of human rights education and the other is a, human, a core human rights and practitioner. So it then begs the question, if we are to push this agenda on the continent, how then do we get people black people who are interested in um, this topic. And then maybe secondly, what is the place of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights in the decolonizing agenda since it has been described as a progressive document and all that. So how do you then um, create that balance between the Charter and also the UDHR and other documents? Thank you. Thank you, um, Janet. Uh, Cornelia actually wrote a chapter, um, first chapter in the in um, 
the project book, Human Rights Literacies, on the need to include the African um, Charter in discussions, conversations, and in knowledges of human rights education. That is a very valid um, um, point. I think regarding your other question, I think there's a lot of misconceptions on what decoloniality and decolonizing is. And I think that is why you get all these different streams. You get um, very essentialist scholars working towards Africanization and no Western knowledge. Then you get the, the uh, stream, um, you are white, you cannot speak about decoloniality. Or um, then you can, hopefully you get the in-between people who just realize the necessity of decolonization. And, and my process of decolonizing started with myself. I started questioning um, events and, and happenings in the world. So decoloniality helped me to understand my own experiences and world events. So that is also part of the healing of decoloniality. We need to really uh, make it clear what decoloniality is and also um, think about how we can heal people in South Africa and Africa, South America by helping them understand their own experiences and things like Black Lives Matter. Why does this happen? And decoloniality can help you understand that. I wonder, Anne, if I'm just maybe coming no, in for no, a second. No. Um, I think I want to go back for a moment just to Christy's question about Ubuntu and also Joyce. Um, Ubuntu actually is I am because you are. That is actually the di direct meaning of the wording. It means, in other words, I can't exist without you and you can't exist without me. So individualism is also a part of that. But if I do something wrong, in other words, I don't see a conflict in that. I think, uh, would actually say that in the post COVID situation, I think that process of I am because you are is coming really very much to the fore because we are in a world situation like that. Just maybe a remark on that specific one. And then secondly about the question of our Corley and Janet is um, in the questionnaire, there was a lot of situations about the African Charter. I think many, many people do not think that the African Charter is actually a very, very important charter. It has a lot of information which actually works into the United Nations and into that about, for instance, refugees, the whole situation and um, Janet being a, a student of Professor Francois Fallon will actually know a lot that um, there's a lot of issues in the African Charter, especially the African Children's Charter is a very, very important document that needs to be taken into consideration when you actually work with children and especially in developing environments. So I, I just want to make that very clear. And Cordia, I think that is where the problem is, is that we think mostly of the colonization and the coloniality from a United Nations development or the uh, United Nations declaration, instead of taking a lot of the other issues. I mean, the Muslim Charter on Human Rights is also there. And I, in the chapter that I did was on the cultures of remembrance and how cultures of remembrance inflict in how people think about human rights in these specific place, space and times. And that is maybe just, and I see there's another person who wants to ask a question. And I think, thank you for me. I'm now muting. Yes, I, I, can, uh, I can absolutely, sorry, recommend that uh, ch chapter, if you're interested, very, very good chapter. Very informative. Thank you. We still have the um, sales show. Um, would you like to come in? Yes. Um, Introduce yourself. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. So my name is Serge Chivier. Um, I'm from Center for Social Studies uh, in the University of Coimbra in Portugal. 
So thank you very much for the inspiring presentation. I'm uh, getting a lot from, from this. Um, but my question was, uh, uh, well, if you think that uh, it, it is uh, realistic to decolonize human rights education in the uh, liberal democracies, um, um, particularly um, considering that um, there is structural aspects of racism or commodification of rights? Um, and if so, uh, what's the role of institutions in your perspective? I'm coming back to Audrey's, I would call provocation in the introduction. And uh, um, yes, and if so, how, how can we imagine um, a decolonized uh, liberal democracy? That is the 360 okay. question, sorry for that. <laughs> Thank you, thank you for your question. Absolutely, the answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, because remember, we are speaking about a global we. So if, uh, for example, you are from Portugal, you need to reflect on, on your colonial um, situation or maybe assumptions or oppression and also I think to reimagine is very important if you if you if we think about how um, in trouble a lot of democracies over the world today are it might be beneficial for us to start reimagining liberal democracy not getting rid of liberal democracy, but reimagining liberal democracies in a more pluriversal human way. Does, does that answer your question? It's a big question he's asked. I, I'd like to uh, respond to, to say that it's, I don't think it's just a question of, um, uh, um, decolonizing human rights education, but uh, we have to think, I think, in, in Western Europe, where, where you are, are sitting, um, about how much of our history we actually know, and which parts of our history do we, we cover up. Um, um, and speaking as somebody who studied history um, at school and did their first degree in history, um, I, I'm very, very aware that most of my history did not extend beyond the islands of, um, of um, the British Isles, and most of that focused on England. And, um, and uh, I didn't even uh, study anything about the relationship between um, England and Ireland. So I think I, I think things have changed a little bit in schools. This is talking about the past, but when I also talk to students today or look at the history curriculum, I remain deeply concerned about the ways we approach these things within Europe and how we also um, often uh, working in Norway, we divide Europe into countries that colonized the world and countries that did not. And, and clearly, um, uh, there was a, there is an interrelationship between uh, these these developments. So we can't say, okay, we we'll take Portugal, France, uh, Britain on one side, and then we'll take Ireland and Norway and uh, and some other country on another side. It doesn't doesn't work like that. It's about looking at that global we in the past, I think, as well. Um, yeah. I must. I, I don't know if Cornelia would like to add. No, you're absolutely right. Thank you. Yeah. Hey. I can unmute myself. I agree 100% with that. I think one of the issues that came very much forward in the research that we've done with the different countries was um, I would actually say, I don't want to call it the lack of knowledge. I want to call it the lack of interpretation of who I am when I am in a specific place, space and time. I think it comes to that because um, in cultures of remembrance, even if you're in the vis very multi-layered society that we are, and I think in, I have traveled a little bit into some of Gabon, for instance, and I, I was surprised when I came there in the schools 
and I saw the strong Western way of the curriculum handling, but still within a specifically African way. What I want to try to say is cultures of remembrance of how you perceive the, the history and how you get the history differs a lot from generation to generation. We've got a wonderful book in South Africa, Knowledge in the Blood, written by Professor Jonathan Jansen, who talks about the way that how teacher education students just around this change in 1994 and being the first black, if I might call it like that, dean of a faculty of education, had to really understand the way where the children come from whose parents was against the democratic change. So in a sense, we all have to learn from one another, but never forget what our culture of remembrances are, because that cloud the way that we look at different issues. And especially when it comes into the human rights education classes, what we found is you can have the census but if you want to do a disruption, you have to know what these different subjects and how they perceive their own humanity understands. And I think um, that is one of the main things that we learned from the, the, the students from different layers and different cultures and come back. The students want to talk. The students want to talk and they're frank about their histories and they want to say what they want to think about human rights and how it's actually understood within different cultures and therefore I say I think um, we, we need to learn from one ourselves, but also where we're coming from and how we perceive that information. Thank you Audrey, that's all. From me. Thank you, I'm going to, I, I have been so caught up in this uh, discussion that I didn't notice uh, that we had extended beyond our formal time now. But um, I think uh, Cornelia's uh, point, ending with cultures of remembrance and remembering also students' readiness to contribute is, is uh, something that needs to be very much part of this conversation. You've taken us in directions um, different from last time, different from each session, I think, in, in this uh, webinar series. We're going to take, I'd like to thank both of you very, very warmly for this, uh, uh, creating such an interesting dialogue. And to say to everybody that we will be resuming our webinar series in September. And further details of the webinar series will appear on the Human Rights Education um, uh, Human Rights Education Review uh, platform uh, very, very soon. And thank you all for attending and thank our, our uh, contributors again for their stimulating uh, uh, contributions, which led to a very interesting uh, conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. We thank you. <laughs>